Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. everyone, it's uh, Roxanne Durhodge of Authentic Living. Thanks again for tuning in this week. Today I have a special friend, uh, Suzanne Lindberner, and I always screw up her name. So it's kind of a thing with her and I. I don't do it purposely, but I think she does believe I do it. Um, so she's a psychotherapist like myself and has been in the field of psychotherapy for, uh, goodness, over 25 years now, Sue, isn't it? Yes. Um, so what we thought we would do is have a conversation about the time that we're in and talk a little bit about the upcoming season. Cause I think that's very important that we talk about really what's happening for us. We've talked a lot about um, 2020 and COVID-19, but now I want to specifically talk a little bit uh, with Sue about uh, what rituals like things like um, traditions and special occasions like Christmas need, mean to us in this time. So Sue's been on my show before, and uh, this is goodness, probably about eight months ago. So Sue, thanks again for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, in practice and kind of what you're seeing out there, uh, just generally, you know, in, in 2020, what kind of things are you kind of, what are some of the themes of things that you're seeing maybe that persisted existed prior to the pandemic but has kind of been I, I call it like the you know the exponential effect of yeah. things that you may be seeing with people in their personal lives yes so I you know I work with individuals and I do um, a fair amount of trauma work and people dealing with stress people dealing with loss people dealing going through separation divorce um, people deciding it's time to maybe uh, kind of look a little bit deeper into their lives and, and their histories. And so some of the reasons that people are calling me are, are kind of the same things that I would have been dealing with before the pandemic. And what I noticed at the beginning of the pandemic is that a lot of people were really hunkering down and prepared to do what they needed to do, kind of thinking that it was gonna be a short-term impact. Um, I noticed clients saying that word traditionally quite busy, very busy at keeping themselves busy and distracted from some of their own stuff, were initially a little bit overwhelmed with not being able to distract themselves the way they used to. And so that was difficult for some people and for others, they decided it was a time to dig a little bit deeper um, because they have less ability to distract themselves because there's fewer things that we can do what I'm seeing the last probably couple months is, um, yeah, an undercurrent pretty consistently, no matter what the reason is that people are reaching out, there is this COVID impact, mm -hmm. this, um, you know, this uncertainty, right? It's kind of, I think people are trying very hard to do their best and trying to manage their people are trying to maintain hope. People are trying to find ways to stay connected, to stay busy, to stay healthy. But I think people are getting exhausted. Mm -hmm. I think there is that undercurrent. It, it feels like no matter what anybody is going through in percentage wise, it's like it, it is impacting all of us to some degree. Um, like you said, whether consciously or unconsciously, it's a weight that we have to factor even everyday decisions with, right? Is it safe to go meet somebody? You know, what are the crowds gonna be like? What are the rules today? Um, what are the expectations, um, you know, on us right now in regards to staying safe, keeping others safe? So I, I think I'm seeing it is, it is having a more, um, it's getting heavier, this, this responsibility and these limitations and just the uncertainty. So, so initially, what I think when I was coaching or seeing people or even training, 
you're right. There was like a, we can do this. I, that, that, I saw that, right? Like, okay, like I have the ability, I'm home with my children. I don't have to do my hour and a half commute. Um, you know, oh, I don't have to go to the office every day because something, you know, I can kind of get up and not have that r- ritual in the morning to get ready, get the kids' lunches off, all that kind of stuff. That busyness, right? Yeah, you know, are adapting and saying, oh, this is a lot more time. But I think you're right. As well, we kind of looked into March, it was the beginning. Everybody was kind of, using all their resourceful resourcefulness and then finding meaning and purpose. But now that we're kind of gone back the other, or I'm not, we're now that we're in the second wave, which really that's what we're in. There's that tiredness. I think, like you said, there's a looming, there's a heaviness that when, when, when will this end and how are we going to get through this next impact psychologically, emotionally, uh, financially, Yes. All those things. And a lot of people are saying, I'm not sure how I'm going to do because I've, I've been able to spend some time taking care of myself, but now I'm running out of energy. Right. And I think we, as Canadians, you know, I, I think going into the fall and winter, we do tend to hunker down a little bit and try to bear down. And I think for a lot of people, you know, the, 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 the less sunlight, the less daylight, um, it's not as easy in general to, to pop in and out places. So I think on top, I think in the summer, there was an element of, you know, there was, there was daylight, there was more options, I think, to gather outside, more activities outside. I think people felt safer, but I think on top of, you know, just the, the restrictions, there is this time of year that I think is, is hard, you know, seasonal affective disorder is, is pretty common in, um, you know, our, our communities around here, right? In Canada. I see Belle back there helping us out. <laughs> She's always helping <laughs> out. Belle is so beautiful. Uh, I would say pop, but uh, pretty big. <laughs> that's the and that's ten year old retriever that has been. So just, you know, interestingly for me personally, um, one way for me coping is that you know, I used to kind of begrudgingly take her for walks, fitting it in. And now I make a point of really finding new spots, you know, and spending a little bit more time taking her on hikes. That's been a very good for my mental health. And she likes it. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about, so I I would say that the pervasive, you and I as psychotherapists, um, we understand loss because, uh, you know, whatever, oftentimes when people are coming to us, like you said, there's a separation, potentially there's a trauma, there is some reconfiguring of a, fam- a family to, to, to rule roles, responsibilities, all those things. So thematically, we're often thinking about that. We're thinking of themes. When you think of, um, I would say that COVID is the biggest theme of loss, you know, internationally and globally that any of us could not have perceived this. Right. And now we're going into, you um, traditions like it's it's american thanksgiving just happened and that oftentimes kicks off the christmas season mm-hmm. let's talk a little bit about what that's like what we know about um, traditions and oftentimes uh, christmas is the kind of thing that you know people think about you know trees and, and and you know wrapping presents and cookies and you know putting up the lights all those fun things which i think most people that obviously um celebrate Christmas and joy. But there's a counter side that, to that that I know that I've seen over the years and I'm sure you've seen too. So can talk, let's talk a little bit about what that's like for some of the considerations of things of people not being super happy because they have different, differing circumstances at Christmas. Right, so I think, you know, while Christmas, I think for a lot of us, you know, or the, the holidays, you know, there's traditions and I think traditions are grounding right? I think of them as like being, you know, a framework around our lives, right? So sometimes it's just, they're markers in time, they're things to, <clears throat> to look forward to. But I think we can also identify that, you know, the holidays can be very stressful for families traditionally too. The expectations are high, um, you know, all around the expectations of what it's going to be like, the expectations upon ourselves to be with people that maybe, you know, we wouldn't normally get together with. So I, I, you know, while I think there is, it is different this year, we will be celebrating different. I think it's also really important to highlight <clears throat> different doesn't by definition mean it's better or worse. And so, you know, maybe in regards to 
things won't be the same. And for, for lots of people, it will be a loss, right? There, there is a grieving because people that they care about, they won't be able to gather the same way. Um, all the little celebrations that maybe, yeah, just mark the holidays, you know, even worship is different, right? Um, so I, I think, yeah, it's about how do we find new ways um, that allow us to still have some markers, some structures, some, some type of tradition that maybe, you know, sometimes I think of families that have gone through divorce with little kids. And I've, uh, over the years, I've seen how, especially if it's very new, all, you know, new in, in the separation, uh, parents can get very distraught and very adamant about the need to have their kids on the day of, right, the 25th. And, you know, if we really, and it's emotional and it, there's a, a real sense of loss there, right? It's a win-lose. And, you know, I, I think the, the parents that are most successful in getting through these difficult times are when you can be a little bit flexible, right? And, and really take the time to acknowledge your own grief um, that may be feeding in to these loss of old traditions, and really trying to be creative and how, how can we still maintain connection? How can we still celebrate people that we love? How can we still take care of ourselves? And, you know, I, I think that's kind of what we've had to do all along. And I'm not saying it's easy, right? To think that there's not this wave, I think that we've all experienced. Um, but I think in kind of acknowledging and accepting what we can't do allows us to then move forward and begin to be creative about, well, what can we do? But I think when there's that resistance to accepting it, because I don't want it to be like this, sometimes that being a little bit in limbo or a little bit locked in this state of, I don't have control and I don't like it and I don't want it, although it's a very easy place to get into, it doesn't serve us well in the long run. So that concept of grief, right? Like, you know, really to some degree, and we know there's different stages and stuff like that. Now, you know, I think we've been, like you said, I think, you know, Canadians or just people internationally have been really trying. Like I think of my mom's birthday and we had to do a Zoom call, like, you know, with the 79 year old mother who's yeah. not, who's not hearing so well. And it's like, Oh my goodness, I can, you know, just even though she, she knows the computer, but she doesn't know the computer. Right. So, and, and, and what that was like, and I was experiencing it and she loved it. <laughs> she would be talking when somebody else would be, it was funny, not funny. Right. Um, and, you know, having the grandchildren all over, but it was, and then she really, to her, she was struck that, okay, I can't see them, but I can really still talk to them. So it was a shift that my family had to go through, which my, you know, with my big Trinidadian family all getting together, that was something that we couldn't do anymore. Right. And, um, you know, and then again, we're going to have to do it again at Christmas because now my mom lives in Toronto. Like I know your mom does as well. They're in the gray zone. We're, we're, we're not, but we, you never know. We might kind of get there at which point we're going to be kind of stuck. So that concept of grief, I think to your point about people going through situations like divorces, um, you know, having two traditions, parents like that, that, really acknowledge what they're feeling. And I think that's the important thing that I, I hear you say is, what am I really feeling about not having the things that I'm accustomed to? Right. Right. And what, when, so how, what kind of things could people do um, to deal with some of those, those feelings of grief at this time? I think first of all is, is, you know, just calling it grief right? Just kind of acknowledging that this is grief, right? It's a loss of what was. It's a loss of, you know, our sense of, you know, I think for people that are struggling financially and with their jobs, and it's a loss of, you know, that sense of purpose. It's a loss of autonomy. It's a, it's a loss of having a goal and, and working towards it. You know, that, that control has been taken away for, well, from all of us in, in some level. And so I think even just that very respectful word of acknowledging that, you know, there, it is grief and loss and, and it's okay to feel sad and it's okay that you're not bouncing back. And perhaps for the holidays, it can just feel like a, you know, I, I remember hearing people saying, oh, I've got all this time during COVID now, I'm not working. And 
you know, I'm, I'm hearing people say that they're decorating their homes or, you know, and I'm, I'm having a hard time. What's wrong with me that I don't want to. And I, it, it's just really trusting where you're at and, and taking care of yourself in regards to um, not shaming yourself that I should be feeling a certain way. And what I will say that I think is important for us, period, no matter what, at any time during any kind of crisis is that connection. How am I staying connected? Right. The fact that you're saying, you know what I mean? I, I think I, I went through a bit of that as well is like, I don't feel, you know, I always say, I don't feel the spirit. Like my thing is, you know, I would delay it so I can have like a compacted time to enjoy Christmas. Cause you know, with our schedules, oftentimes, yeah. But this year, there, there is a bit more time and I wasn't feeling, you know, as motivated. And uh, I have a friend that's in my bubble and we just, she came over and we just decorated, but it was just, again, because me living on my own, it was having somebody else to go through that whole tradition with, yeah. even though it's going to, it was different. It was absolutely different, but then I kind of felt a little bit better about it. But, but, so I like the fact that you're saying, acknowledging that, I'm not feeling it as much this year to someone else opens that window for them to say, you know what, I've been also feeling the same or, um, you know, I, you know, when we're talking about things like big box stores now, I think um, just recently there was an announcement with Walmart, for instance, that they're going to separate out the grocery store from the shopping. That was one of the places that people could still go and shop. And now people are telling, you know, you're hearing people talk about it. Like now it means like I can't go out to shop anywhere. So now it takes away that element of actually going out and browsing, which most of us aren't doing that much anyway. Um, and now it's like, it's all online, um, you know, and you know, the, the enjoyment or things like that isn't there as much. I'm sitting behind my computer right. clicking things for RJ that might, might fit for him. And, and there's not that same element of enjoyment of kind of, you know, looking at things and things like that. Well, and even the exchange, you know that I'm just working a little bit in retail this time of year for the Christmas um, season, just to, you know, for myself, for my own mental health, because I work from home and I am alone. Um, so just to break that up. And it's interesting because what I, what I notice, you know, is that um, people, we are social beings. So just even saying, hello, how are you? You know, it, you know, that that small chit chat is really enough. I think sometimes if you're really struggling with feeling alone and isolated, the more we're alone and isolated, the more that can feed the belief that I'm alone and, and isolated. So there is something quite um, powerful about just having that exchange with another human being. Doesn't have to be heavy, doesn't necessarily have to be focused on how I'm feeling, but that light chit chat. I think of even, you know, people that, people have shared with me even walking their dog you know it's nice to see somebody else walking by that you say hello to mm -hmm. right we can keep our distance but i i think we have to be really careful especially as it gets colder right especially as it gets darker i think our tendency is to hibernate a little bit more i i think all things considered of what's going on i think we have to be really careful and really self monitoring and self reflecting you know, I'm feeling pretty blah, but I'm going on day three or four, you know, of in my pajamas, not really getting dressed. Maybe it yes. would be a good idea to see if somebody wants to do a socially distant walk with me mm -hmm. or, you know, even reaching out and calling somebody or FaceTiming. Um, yeah, I think we, we have to be careful of falling into that all or nothing. I can't have it the way... I want it to be in the way I'm used to, it, it can be easy to give up a little bit of hope. Absolutely. And I, you know, what I like about what you just said, Sue, is even story, right? You know, we know how, how powerful um, the element of healing with storytelling is. And even, you know, having people share maybe stories with each other. I was just, I just thought about this when you said that about some, you know, things that you, memories even over of Christmas, like, let's say you can't, you know, like I can't see my mom uh, till, or, you know, cause you know, she's in Peel. So probably not till Christmas. And because, you know, she's a bubble with my sister and myself, we'll be able to go there for Christmas. 
um, because they've made that exception, but I can't see her till then. But there's so many little things that we do before. But I was thinking is when you said that is maybe people starting to talk about some of the things that they remembered or they enjoyed leading up might be a helpful kind of thing. Cause so, you know, I'm from Trinidad and um, you know, what would happen is uh, every Christmas Eve, um, my mom would, you know, and mind you, it was warm, right? Don't think of Canadian summers. Um, you know, it's like Canadian summers in Trinidad all the time. And she would get us all dressed up. There was six of us and send us off with my dad to have um, breakfast Christmas Eve morning with my grandparents, which were just up the street. And that was such a big thing. But I remember all these little memories, right? Like, and so my mom could kind of prepare for Christmas and then we would go house to house, right? Really, because people weren't very far away. So I think sharing those kind of things about some of the memories might be actually helpful for people, like if they can't be physically, physically together or even Christmas Eve, right? Like Christmas Eve memories or stories or uh, things like that. It's almost like we're going back to some of the traditions prior to us being connected, um, you know, about stories, you know, I think that would be, I, I just think of myself with my memories, you know, growing up elsewhere in different traditions. I love those old stories. So maybe that's something people can start considering, to, you know, not waiting for just the time, but having a buildup of right. time sharing right. even before just the one day, right? Right. There's a lot of pressure on that one day. Oh, you know, absolutely. And, you know, maybe, you know, for, you know, hopefully people will have some time off and maybe it's, it's, it's really taking care of, you know, ourselves. Like, what would I really like to do if I really want to watch Christmas movies all day long or old movies, you know, and I remember when, you know, being very busy and stressed and stressed and yeah, how, how much I enjoyed that feeling not guilty or, um, you're simplifying it, right? I think it does have to be simpler this year mm -hmm. um, within your means, like, you know, looking at the reality of what I can and can't do. Somebody just shared with me, it was a young person who is writing letters. And that just made me think, you know, this time, if we can't be with everyone, you know, maybe the person that lives in Toronto, that's not that far. But, you know, what about writing a Christmas card and maybe taking the time, um, you know, to write a letter, you know, to really identify how I feel about you, you know, uh, what that person means to you. Um, yeah, it just struck me as, you know, an, an old fashioned, uh, underused, I think, means of connection and, and maybe sharing, right? What, what this holiday means to you, what the people in your life mean to you. Um, if you can't be in person, are there other ways to feel connected and stay connected? So the concept of that it's grief, and in fact, that if we kind of accept that we're feeling certain feelings, lots of different feelings, and everybody's going to be different, right? Everybody's different people have, have had different responses. I know you, I know in my life, like there's been people that have been like, I'm not seeing anybody to, yeah. <laughs> to, to kind of the pendulum swinging a little bit too far, which is like, whoa, that's kind of unsafe. So, you know, you have to kind of pivot based on who you're connected with to kind of, yeah. you know, be okay with your space in reference to that particular space. But I wonder like, you know, um, maybe kind of creating a narrative based on what you're experiencing to help the other person in your lives understand what you're experiencing and to elicit that kind of conversation with them. Yeah, I think talking about your own COVID guidelines is a very sensitive topic, right? What, what, I, what my risk tolerance is, you know, is, is my experience is very, typically there's nuances with everybody else's so I think it's you know how do we respectfully accept that we're all doing our best um and how do we yeah really try to have some you know empathy for we're all in different situations we all have different histories we are all trying to cope with a very you know exceptionally uh stressful time in our lives mm -hmm. right and it's and very so difficult right like and I think you and I with our kind of profession we you know people come to us uh and and sometimes well people will come just because they like you said they want you know to have a, a an objective third party to talk through something exactly. but what I found now is that the people that I'm seeing um people are distressed they may have been stressed before 
And now they're, the heaviness that they're carrying around, and they're trying to explain it and say, you know, I don't know what I'm experiencing. And I, and, you know, and then I, I normalize it for them that, you know, I'm a therapist like you are, but I'm also a person. And there's been a heaviness that I felt, even though I, I do all the things to take care of myself, that I kind of sit there sometimes and say, what is this about? And then I say, well, of course, like, you know, I'm worried if I go to the grocery store, I'm worried about my mom who's 79. I'm worried my dad about eight, who's 84. I'm worried about, you know, when I see clients, you know, if I do see them in person, am I being safe or are they being, safe? there's lots of things that are constantly kind of going through my head. You know, and then I, when I think when I've shared that, they go, wow, I guess you're thinking about those things as well. And I said, absolutely, because we all want to be safe at this time. And, you know, even though consciously we might think, oh, I've done everything to take care of myself. When we kind of, you know, what, what is that story playing through your head that you might still be worrying that you're not even aware that you're worrying about things. Right. right. So, you know, every time we leave the house, we're doing a different kind of, there's an extra layer that we have to go through right with um I, I think it does take its toll on people you know you can't just easily run to the corner store without making sure you you know you have your mask without checking to see how many people are in the store without just this you know and that's just one little thing in, in amongst many other things that we're doing in a day mm -hmm. so i think it does take its toll on us so let's talk a little bit about people with children or little children at home i've just you know, I think about that and obviously our kids are older and, um, you know, Santa, they, you know, they're not talking about that anymore, but there's people that have little ones uh, that, first of all, having to explain to them and, and I'm, you know, I'm always amazed how well little kids do when you tell them about the mask and, you know, and then they adapt, right? So I'm just thinking about traditions for them as we go into things like, you know, Santa coming and, you know, those types of things. What kind of suggestions would you have for people that maybe have littler ones um, to help them get through the traditions without kind of taking away that happiness uh, right. space within little ones? I think, again, it reminds me of when we talked about with, you know, parents that are newly divorced, you know, the little kids aren't going to really care what, the actual date is right so if they get to um you know show up at mom or dad's and there's presents for them and there's celebration it really doesn't matter to them if it's the 27th or the 25th so i would say again parents you know it's acknowledging your own grief and, and i do want to make room amongst all of this for the potential that maybe it is it could be a little bit easier this year because there's not the expectations to drive to that in-laws and that in-laws and that person's party and that work party. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a free pass now, right? You don't have to make an excuse. You don't have to force yourself to go. So I have had that feedback, people saying that, that they're trying to look at it with, you know, maybe it's just, it is a, it's a, a holiday season where the expectations are different. So I think making room for that, if you can, to see the other, you know, there may be some things that aren't happening but maybe there's room for some things that might make room for um, a little bit of ease, right? A little bit of breathing easier, a little bit of, of just being. So I would say for parents to check in with their own feelings, first and foremost, how am I coping? Because how they're coping, right? will model how the kids are coping. The kids are going to, they're going to follow their parents um, directions. They're, they're going to be looking to their parents for cues. So if parents are rolling with the punches, if parents are finding a way to make, you know, sense of things to make, um, you know, if the traditions are a little bit different this year and parents are able to find a way to embrace that, then kids are going to accept it. Like you said, you know, kids are quite adaptable. They're looking to the adults in their life, right? To follow their lead. So I think really try not not projecting too much of our own heaviness, our own big picture worries onto our kids. I guess so to also think if I am having heaviness, what is it that I could do for myself? Right. right? Because you may have a, you may be trying your best and let's say the child is just, you know, having a bit of a meltdown, you know, your capacity to, to hold that space for that child really depends on how you're coping. Right. So to really kind of think of, you know, um, what can I do? And to give yourself that gap, potentially, if you think, oh, I'm spent, 
I, I really can't do any more. Um, and then the, maybe the child's, you know, overreacting to, to really kind of think, what can I do to kind of create that gap so that I don't kind of get into something with a child that's, you know, maybe not understanding as much. And just be gentle and kind to yourself. That's what I've been saying to a lot of people at this time. Like, there's no, there's no roadmap. And every time we get to, you know, we think we might be turning right, there's a detour and we don't know which detour we should take because it's been changed, right? And all of us like certainty as human beings. And, and I think that's the pervasive element that I think um, as a psychotherapist or even as a coach is that none of us like to be uncertain. Yeah, yeah. And we've had to come to the point where we're recognizing that not too many, there aren't too many constants here. And as human beings, we like to put things in buckets, right? We kind of try to find a category, you know, of things. Okay, this belongs here, this belongs here, but we've that's been disrupted at, at a profound level. And and I think for the most part, you I would say the most people are pretty resilient. Uh, but if people had pre-existing is, issues even before coming into COVID, it's just kind of it's like putting a Bunsen burner underneath it. It's just gotten, you know, bigger and bigger. And I know I've seen, like I said, more depression, more anxiety, more addictions, those types of things are just that heaviness that people aren't able to get rid of. So they might be using things outside of themselves to cope a little bit more. Right. right. I always think of parenting in general, right? How do you put that oxygen mask on yourself before you offer it to your, to your child? So, and again, remembering, you know, parenting during the holidays can be stressful any year right so you know I, I think it's again just being aware that it can be a stressful time of business and expectations and being realistic about what you can do at any given time being fair with yourself being um yeah being fair with yourself and that piece of what is within my control right so if definitively you know maybe we know that we can't do the things that we would have liked to have done. Well, what can I do? I, I, I love the idea of plan A isn't working, not stopping there. Well, what is plan B? If that doesn't, you know, what, what can I do that's within my control and within our control today? And maybe not, you know, trying to, especially during the holidays, maybe not trying to guess when things are going to change or worry about when you know, knowing that they will, we just don't have that definitive answer that, as you said, we like to have. So I'm just thinking um, one, one last quest question before we wrap up, but I'm just thinking, as we think of the time that we're going to be off over the or Christmas, and we think of the people in our lives that we may not be able to see potentially. Um, one thing that I'm thinking, Sue, is that maybe kind of thinking through what are your traditions? How might they be altered? And maybe kind of start to think or anticipate what those needs are of those relationships and some potential things that you can do to connect ahead of time. Right. Does that make sense? Because I'm just thinking, right? You know, like, you know, every Christmas Eve, you would do this or every Christmas morning, you do blah, or you go to church or, you know, Boxing Day, you would have leftovers or you'd have Chinese food or, you know, we all have these things to really kind of starting to anticipate now from, from the lens of loss or grief. What is it that I'm going to be missing, but potentially the other person on the other end, how are they like me, not like me, and maybe how they... Um, might need something a bit different from you as well. Right. And for you to also think might, maybe what might you need differently from them too. Right. And, right. and being realistic of what you can offer, right? We, we can't change people's minds, right? If, if you know, I think we can be as compassionate and, and show as much empathy as possible, um, but we're not going to make people feel different, right? If people are struggling, if, if, you know, loved ones, if there's other people that are struggling, we have to be realistic about what we can offer and, and uh, the extent, you know, our, our boundaries, right? I, I can't be, I can't be held responsible that this is different and the other person may not like it. And, and again, just to be reminded, like you said, you know, those traditions we may not be able to do. And so maybe if, you know, you're not going out for breakfast, um, you know, maybe there's a special meal that you love to have that you make this year. That's different, right? I, I think it really, there is an opportunity to be creative. There is an opportunity, you know, maybe it's, it's with a family member. 
you know, do you want to make the same thing? You know, what are you making? Maybe I'll try making it. You know, what's the recipe? Grandma, auntie, mom, brother, you know, what's, what's, do you remember that recipe? You know, maybe I'm going to try making that. I think, and there's still the telephone. Right. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think so. And, you know, I know with some of my meetings, for instance, uh, I have a board that I sit on. What they did is they they thought of little things that we can open together when we have a meeting or even, you know, a little if it's something small, even a symbol like, you know, that you can maybe get on the line with someone and open it at the same time, like you said, or you create a meal together that, you know, um, you know, that you would create, say, Christmas Eve and you can make it and the other person can also make it. And you can try it together and also, you know, talk about, you know, what that experience is like, what it tastes like. Oh, I'm not so good at, and that would be me with my cooking abilities with my sisters kind of thing, because obviously, you know, it's something that may, maybe I would do with them, but now I'm not being able to do, do it. So just being, I think a bit creative and thinking to um, people that are alone, right? Like what could you do to, to reach out in some way? It's different if people have families and those types of things but people that are alone, I often say at this time, or people that have had shifts, like you said, separations, illnesses, there may be people that are immune compromised that just can't get together with um, family members, whether they're older or not, right. kids go getting together with grandparents, all that stuff, just to really think about what could you do to make sure that you maintain that connection, like you said. Yeah, and I think if, you know, if you've got a bigger family, I, I think it, it's helpful if you have some dialogue about checking in, right? That's not all call on, on the 25th of Christmas with no conversations before or after. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, I've had many, many people sharing that, that were very intimidated by Zoom and technology and FaceTime, like you said, with your mom, that have, you know, really um, this feeling of success, right? They, they've done it now and it's opened up some other options. So, you know, I know somebody that's a big sister to a little boy and, um, through big brothers, big sisters, and they bake together. So his family gets the ingredients. She has them and, you know, a little bit awkward at first, but this, we've been doing this for a while. And so it's remembering that that I, I, I appreciate we're a little bit tired of it as well. But if we, we find ways to be flexible with it, mm-hmm. right? I, I think things, you know, I've, I've, I've heard of wine, wine tastings, right? <laughs> Where, you know, and like you said that we know that feeling, it feels good when I've done something kind for somebody else. So if you, you know, there's, um, sending a card, writing a letter, making a phone call, if you know, if you can afford sending a little package, care package, dropping it off. Those things are good for us as human beings, right? That connection. So if I'm struggling, I think there's a lot of research around this. Me thinking of somebody else in that time just allows connection outwards, right? It helps us get through that time. You see, when and you get lit up, I even think of myself, I had a friend and she dropped a, those, this beautiful bouquet, probably yeah, a plant, right, about, say, six weeks into COVID. And, you know, it's funny how that it was like the, it, you know, it was like Christmas morning for me. It was like, and she was, you know, already maintaining her distance. So she dropped it off. Then she called me and she says, I'm out front. And she yeah. stepped away, but it was such a, it was, it, it just lit up my heart that, cause I hadn't seen her also. And I recognized that, you know, like you said, um, adapting to that person's risk tolerance and stuff like that. So it, it was a big step for her to come to my home yeah. and to drop it off. But it was such a, not, I, I mean, that, that made me feel so happy for, you know, just to be able to look and, and enjoy the flowers and stuff like that. So I think sometimes it's yeah. those, those little things, how significant they are, what they, it doesn't have to be all the bells and whistles, right? Right. Right. Um, Which is oftentimes what Christmas gets is it's, it it gets into that consumerism and stuff like that, you know, whereas I think it's the simple act of kindness that I think will probably get us through this and, for us to be gentle and kind, not just with others, but also with ourselves to say, you know, how are we going to create the memory in a less than ideal situation 
so that we can get through this uns as unscathed as possible, where some of us are going to be sad yeah. through going through different situations, but that's normal. And if you are sad, just experience it as, yeah. you know, kind of where, where we're at in the world or where, how we're, how we're going through things. Yeah. So Sue, this has been amazing. Any last words for people, um, for people that are wanting to maybe connect with you that uh, might want to reach out for your services? I want you to tell them where they can reach you or just any kind of last words that you'd have around coping through, through the holidays. Well, you know, I know there are quite a few resources that have been put out by the provincial government, you know, I suspect federal and probably in other areas. Um, there, you know, the distress center is 24 seven, right? I think there's a lot more awareness of people just needing to get through those humps in the day, those moments that can feel overwhelming. And so not to hesitate. I think people have an understanding, you know, that it has to be very dire before I reach out and, and ask for help. We're all in this together. Everybody understands it. So there's a shared experience in that regard. Nobody, nobody is going to not understand what it feels like to be struggling with COVID. And I would really encourage people, you know, especially if they're feeling lonely and they're feeling maybe some loss is, is to not necessarily wait for others to reach out. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I think it's really important to, to make that connection yourself. Guarantee the person on the other end of the line, you know, will be happy to hear from you. I, I think we are all, we're all struggling with, with a little more isolation, right? A little less socializing, uh, a little less joy and hope so there is something to be said for that human connection of taking care of each other and maybe whereas before we'd go oh they're too busy mm -hmm. or i don't want to i don't want to worry them with my problems i don't want to you know trusting that i think just sharing our experiences is um is you know it's quite a profound human connection and, and that can, you know, not just our, our hard times, but also just in general, how we're feeling. And like you said, it's a nice opportunity to talk about some recipes or favorite Christmas memories. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or wear your ugliest um, yes. Christmas Ugly. sweater and, <laughs> and do, you know, get together and, and laugh and joke and, and share stories, those types of things. Well, thanks again for your time. Where can people reach you if they're wanting to, um, you know, work with you? Sue Limburner dot com okay and the, it, the link will be in the show notes as well so what am i walking away with i think um just being kind and gentle for your to yourself um accepting that this is a unfortunately this year will be a grief-ridden kind of experience for most of us we are human beings and we're mammals and we need to connect so to think what could i do to extend out to connect to the people in my life and to sue's point don't wait till Christmas day, but try to maybe, you know, reach out even before so that you can have a bit more of a, you know, a conversation about what potentially is going on. So if for anybody that would like to have a consultation, how to connect a little bit more authentically, um, you know, you can, um, you know, hit the link below with the show notes and you can get to me um, through uh, roxanderhodge.com. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.